Okay, it's 1230. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining our live. Our live will talk about home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis. What's the difference? And I have with me Joanne Smith. She is the kidney care advocate for Fresenius, and she has done many things in her career. She's been a clinical manager with um, Fresenius. She's uh, initiated the home therapy program, uh, and she's actually been a nephrology nurse for 28 years. Uh, Joanna is involved in many different things, and um, she, in fact, she was also my clinical manager when I was on dialysis, and we've been friends now since 2007. Uh, Joanne is also involved in American Nephrology Nurses Associations, but first and foremost, aside from being an RN, Joanne donated one of her kidneys to a patient in 2015, and she is doing exceptionally well, and that's just such so honorable and so brave to, to donate a kidney. So Joanne, thank you so much for joining us today. I, I just can't tell you how much we appreciate it. And if you could just talk about home hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, and what's the difference? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, actually, it was brought to my attention uh, through a survey that our, our company performed that a lot of people have no idea that there's even a difference. Um, people, when you say home dialysis, they automatically think home peritoneal dialysis, like, which is the catheter in the belly. Um, but there is home hemodialysis, and, and it's been around for a long time as well. Um, so I'm just going to kind of break down the differences. Um, so for home peritoneal dialysis, uh, we consider that the, the gentlest kind of natural way to perform dialysis. Um, we have lots and lots of folks that do peritoneal dialysis, or we call it PD. They live alone. Um, so you really don't need a partner um, as long as you're fairly independent. Um, how PD or peritoneal dialysis works is uh, in your abdomen or your belly area, there is a lining um, and it's called your peritoneum and it's, it's very vascular. So there's a lot of blood vessels in that area. And what happens is, is you'll have a, a could be a, a 45 minute outpatient surgery to place what we call a PD catheter, which is a police, uh, uh, a piece of very flexible soft tubing. It's about 12 inches on the inside and about another 12 inches on the outside. Usually heals up in about two weeks. Um, and once that's healed up, you can shower. You can swim in a chlorinated pool. You can swim in the ocean. Uh, we prefer that you stayed out of a hot tub, a lake, or a river, just because we don't want bacteria around that, that exit site where that catheter is. But once that's healed up, um, your training starts and most people honestly train for about a week to maybe 10 days. It's very, very easy. And honestly, the training could be even shorter, but we really, really uh, want to emphasize any risk for infection because that's one of the things that people will talk about with peritoneal dialysis. They'll say, oh, you know, high rate of infection. But if the procedure is performed as trained, as, as directed, um, really that the risks are minimal. Um, basically, basically, when we talk about training, the first piece is, you know, I told you this catheter is inside the body um, and it does have a cap on the outside, but when you remove that cap and the only time you'll remove it would be to connect to additional tubing to, to perform your treatment, you would wear a mask. If anybody else is in the room, they would need a mask. As far as pets are concerned, you can have pets, but we just ask that they're outside of the door of the room that you're doing this, this procedure in because you can't put a mask on a pet, right? Um, so basically a mask is on for you and anyone in the room. Good hand washing is an, another big step that we talk about. And then um, further down the line, we talk about the importance of not becoming constipated. Uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, with constipation, the area where the tube or the catheter is placed 
um, is, is in the same area where your bowels are, right? And so when you become constipated, the bowels swell up and they can, eat, they can prevent um, for the fluid from coming in or going out. And then also can, can sometimes pull uh, uh, the, the stool through the bowel into the peritoneum and that creates an infectious process. So we talk a lot about you know, making sure that <clears throat> you have regular bowel movements, people get very comfortable with that. Um, but basically how peritoneal dialysis works is we provide you with a sterile solution either manually or through a machine overnight while you sleep that will go into the peritoneal membrane. It'll sit there for a period of time for about an hour to maybe two hours, depending on how quickly or slowly your body does the dialysis. And what happens there because of the vascular, uh, all the veins and arteries that are in that area, your body will automatically pull the excess fluid and toxins into that solution that's in the peritoneal membrane. Once that happens, then we teach you to drain that fluid out. Or if you're on the machine overnight, the machine will drain that out overnight while you sleep. Um, and so this process happens um, so there's two ways to do peritoneal dialysis. One is without the machine, and we generally will teach that first. Um, a lot of people like to do that, and that's also called continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, or CAPD. Um, and we teach you to do that manual procedure first, um, because if you have a power failure, you wouldn't be able to use the machine. Um, and sometimes people, if they're on the road, we have guys that are long haul truckers, they're doing this type of dialysis on the road. They're, they're, the inside of the trucks are clean, um, but there's no reason why that this can't happen, you know, in a clean area. They have masks, they have waterless hand sanitizer, and they can do it on the road. Um, to do manual exchanges, um, it's usually four a day. Some people can get away with three um, if you're first starting out sometimes, but generally it's four exchanges. It usually takes about a half hour, maybe a little bit more between setup and, and getting disposing of, of what you've used. Um, but I kind of tell people, if you think, you know, people say, oh, it sounds like a lot. But when your kidneys are functioning, we use the restroom. You know, you usually urinate at least four times a day, right? And we kind of, that's spread throughout the day. Um, very naturally, your body will, you know, gather uh, excess fluid and toxins and you'll urinate first thing in the morning sometime around lunchtime, sometime around dinner, and then before you go to bed. And that's just roughly, it could be more or less. But that's how you would kind of schedule out your, your exchanges. Um, and I tell people, so it's not based on like a medicine at 8, 12, 4, and 8, or anything like that. You really are going to do this around your lifestyle. Right. You could wake up in the morning, get yourself situated, set up to do your manual exchange. We give you absolutely everything you need. Um, we give you an IV pole because the, the solution has to be hung higher than your belly and the drain bag would be lower than your belly. Um, but it doesn't have to be on an IV pole. I mean, if you're in a hotel, you can hang it on a hook. You can, you know, um, basically, like I said, the truckers throw the bag up on the dashboard and the drain bag is on the floor. But basically, you put your mask on, your hands are clean, the end of your catheter is cleaned, you um, take the cap off and, and connect to a set of tubing. Um, automatically, the drain will start, so you'll drain for about 10 minutes, and then there's a connection, and you open up that connection, and now this fill, full bag of, of sterile solution will come into the peritoneal membrane. Once that sterile solution is in there, you're going to cap off, put a new cap on the end of your catheter, and then what you're going to have is a drain bag um, full of what looks like urine, because that's what it is, right? So it's your body's way of taking this sterile solution in through your peritoneal membrane, the toxins and the excess fluid going into that fluid, and then that drain fluid, and it, and it looks like urine, because really that's what it is. Uh, anyway, we'll teach you to drain that out. You know, you're going to look at that fluid to make sure that there's no signs of infection. And the whole training process is going to teach you what to look for. Um, just like if you have a urinary tract infection and you have cloudy urine, that's your indicator, right? So if your fluid 
that your um, your drain fluid is is cloudy, that would indicate a, um, a possible urinary tract infection or a, a, I'm sorry, a peritonitis. Um, so for us, our nurses are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So if you have any indication of any type of, uh, you know, any kind of abdominal issues, gas, even gas or cloudy fluid, you're going to call your, your home training nurse right away. Um, we certainly would want to treat you as soon as possible if you have peritonitis. And we would rather treat you and you not have peritonitis than you have peritonitis and let it go for a couple of days. Because what ends up happening at that point is you could get very, very sick. Mm -hmm. And you scar up your, your membrane. When mm -hmm. you scar up the membrane enough, you're not going to be able to use that to do your dialysis. So um, in a nutshell, that's kind of manual exchanges are for a day. It is seven days a week for most people, um, you know, because it is very gentle. With, with that type of dialysis, um, so if people are uh, kind of comparing to what in-center dialysis is, you don't have, your blood pressure doesn't drop, you don't feel washed out after the treatment, there's no cramping or anything like that um, because it's a very gentle type of dialysis. Um, so, so we know that people with high blood pressure and people that are diabetics you know, our, our primary patients. Um, so it does require some uh, control with your blood sugar. Um, there are different strengths of solution that will teach you based on what, whatever your blood sugar is. And if you're not, not diabetic, you would primarily use the weakest strength solution. But the strength of the solution is, is based on a dextrose content or sugar content. And um, so if you have a lot of fluid on board, you know, we would train you to use a higher strength solution and that will pull more fluid off. Um, honestly, the majority of our patients actually will just get on what we call a cycler overnight. They can set this cycler up and it does the same thing, right? So it has bigger bags of fluid. It seems to be a technical problem. Joanne. Oh. Yolanda, I see you're here. Are you able to hear me and not hear your Joanne? Oh, Joanne, you were you were mute for a, se a second. Uh, oh, I think somebody was trying to call me. Okay. Sorry. All right. Sorry. That's okay. Yeah, so, so um, I don't know where that went in, but um, so a lot of people will do the cycler overnight. Um, and like I said, that, you know, depending on what their prescription is, um, it could be anywhere from like eight to nine hours. And sometimes as time goes on and they start their kidney out or their urine output starts declining, it may be a little bit longer. But there are different ways, different prescriptions that we can use, you know, with the doc, we'll talk about um, a pause or maybe doing a manual during the day to kind of cut back on that time at night. So there's a couple different ways that we can, you know, because people will say, well, I don't sleep for eight hours or, you know, there's different things that we can do to kind of manipulate that prescription so it works for people. Or even, like I said, CAPD is really a good option as well. Um, you do need some space in your house. Um, so I tell people, if you think about how much space a washer and dryer take up sitting side by side, that's the amount of space you're going to need um, for your peritoneal dialysis supplies. Um, you know, you can get creative, but I really try and encourage people, try and have the delivery guy bring the supplies near where you're going to use them. I know we have people that have, um, you know, two-story houses. A lot of times they don't want the supplies in a bedroom, so they'll put them down the basement and then every night they're trucking up these supplies uh, into their room. So if you have um, space available near your bedroom where you're gonna do this overnight, um, my advice is really to get those supplies there. Um, if you travel, you can either do manual exchanges or you can bring your machine with you. It travels, it's a, it's a medical device, it travels free of charge. Um, but basically uh, the people that deliver supplies um, you'll be in touch with them monthly, you know, to put in your order. 
And so if you're going to travel somewhere, I suggest that as soon as you know where you're going to travel, you give them the address, the length of time that you're going to be, wherever it is that you're going to be, and those supplies will get delivered um, within the United States um, to wherever it is. So that kind of saves you from having to lug all those supplies. Um, we do, do train people um, in case of infection. We have what we call an infection uh, medication um, kit. And we actually train patients how to use that, but we don't want them to use it. We want them to call the nurse. The nurse will then call the doctor, review the symptoms that the patient is having. And then um, basically the nurse will review with the patient how to use the antibiotic kit. But, but what we do want is a sample of that, that drain fluid so we can culture that to send it out to see exactly what we're dealing with, whatever type of bacteria, so we can treat it appropriately. Um, what else do I want to say about PD? Oh, okay, so a big plus for peritoneal dialysis as well is people that do peritoneal dialysis, because it is so gentle, they are actually able to continue to put out urine for a much longer period of time. I don't know if everybody's aware of this, but a lot of times that when people do the three times a week in the clinic type of dialysis, they usually stop urinating or really the, the, the amount of urine that they put out declines significantly. So what that means is, you know, any fluid that you're taking in really needs to be drawn off on dialysis. But with peritoneal dialysis, they're actually able to put out urine for a much longer period of time, which really is a big plus um, for people. So, so I guess, should I just move right on to home hemo, Nancy? Sure. Okay. All right. So home hemodialysis, I, I know for myself, um, uh, being a dialysis nurse for 28 years, I was a clinical manager for almost 10 years. And I thought, I don't want people doing this at home. You know, the thought of them doing, people doing um, home hemodialysis really made me quite nervous. Um, we use what's called next stage. It's N-X-S-T-A-G-E. And you can look that up online. They have a lot of really good um a lot of really, really good videos, a lot of good education information, uh, but that's what we use. It's a, it's a shorter, it's not like the big dialysis machine in the clinic. Um, and when I went into the home dialysis field, um, you know, just a handful of people were on, started using this next stage machine. And time after time, I would hear about how much energy they have, how much better they felt. And initially I was like, eh, you know, not so sure, but it truly is, the, it's the truth, right? So um, it's more frequent dialysis, um, but it's similar to what happens in the clinic, right? So same thing, you're, we're teaching you to put two needles in your either fistula or graft. Um, we're teaching you how to set this machine up, um, how to make the purified water, um, so the first step, a nurse would come to your home to take a water sample to make sure, that, and also to make sure that you have a place for supplies and a clean area um, to do your dialysis treatment. Um, most people do four or five days a week, right? But what's really nice about um, the, the home hemo, so it's a shorter treatment, it's more frequent. So if you think about your heart, right? So it doesn't uh, allow your body time to build up that excess fluid because you're getting rid of that fluid and, and there's toxins more frequently. So there's less, um, you know, blood pressure dropping, less cramping. Um, people are able to eat more. Same with peritoneal dialysis. Their diet is less restricted. Um, with home hemodialysis, though, the training is quite longer, right? So for peritoneal dialysis, most people train in seven to 10 days. For home hemodialysis, most people train anywhere from four to six weeks. So they actually will come to the training center, they'll receive their dialysis treatment and train a little bit each time. And it'll be a one-on-one -on -one training, just like peritoneal dialysis with a, with a nurse, right? So you're training with a nurse and as you get more comfortable, you know, then you'll start performing the procedure. You know, like I said, we teach you how to create the purified water, um, you know, and then when you're comfortable, um, basically, we, you know, bring all the equipment to your home, the machine, the supplies, and then for a couple of days more of training, the nurse will be there to observe, you know, that you're capable, that you can perform a safe treatment, that you're confident in your abilities, 
Um, same thing. There's a 24 hour nurse available. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a good type of, uh, of dialysis. I mean, because if you think about in center dialysis, when you're assigned to a clinic, so you're assigned to a particular location, a particular shift, uh, you know, so it would be Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, you know, you might have to be there at 530 in the morning or, you know, midday or even evening, whatever. Um, but with home hemodialysis, you will set your time and your and your and your days, right? So, you know, um, certainly we don't want you to cram four days in a row of dialysis because that really wouldn't make a lot of sense anyway. Um, and then you would have three days or or two days where you weren't getting um, dialysis. A lot of people will do like every other day. Um, and like I said, you could wake up in the morning and say, ah, you know, I'm not feeling like getting my dialysis first thing in the morning. I'll do it later in the afternoon or evening, you know, or maybe tomorrow I, I need off for something. So I'll take that day off. It just really, um, you know, gives you a, a good quality of life and you can do your dialysis around your schedule. We have a lot of folks that work. Um, so they're able to, you know, do this when they come home from work and not have to worry about taking time off or, or you know, feeling poorly after the treatment. Um, same thing with this machine. Now, the, the machine's a little bit heavier, weighs about 42 pounds, but you can travel with that machine and, and the supplies would get shipped ahead as well. Um, but we have we have folks that go camping or cruises or whatever, and they they um, take their home hemodialysis machine with them. Um, one thing I did want to mention with peritoneal dialysis, um, if you were to cruise, um, you can't really bring that machine with you um, on a dialysis or any type of cruise, right? So the the ship is moving. Um, with the, the peritoneal dialysis machine, the top of the machine is actually a scale, so it would not be able to calibrate. So people that go on dial or go on cruises will um, just do manuals on the cruise, which is which is fine. Usually, it's not a problem for people. Um, but home hemodialysis, a lot of people, the first uh, big obstacle for most people is there's no way that I'll put needles in my arm. Um, so we actually do teach people to, to do the cannulation or putting the needles in, or um, if they have somebody at home that can help them, um, we will teach that person as well. Um, so when we first started with home hemodialysis, it was primarily you had to have a patient. They you know, had to be there with you the whole time. And now we have a program that's uh, a procedure that's called SOLO. Um, so certainly your nephrologist would have to agree that you have a stable treatment and that it, it's, you know, you can do a solo treatment, but we do have quite a few patients that do solo hemodialysis at home. Um, and, uh, you know, honestly, um, so I know a lot of people uh, that actually are in the clinic and they are putting their needles in themselves. Um, so even if, if you're not considering home hemodialysis, you know, the more you can do, even in the center, know what your machine is, you know, know what the numbers mean, know what your dry weight is, know how much fluid should be pulled off. I mean, really know your body and, you know, and, and if you are brave enough or, you know, interested, um, I, I, you know, certainly would consider teaching, you know, having to put the needles in. Um, you know, the more you can do for yourself and the more independent you are, and the more you know about your dialysis treatment, you know, the, the healthier it is for your body. Um, but either peritoneal dialysis or home hemodialysis, both types of dialysis, um, you know, there's, there's lots of, of information out there that more frequent dialysis is much better for your body, you know, um, and kind of makes sense, right? So when, when your kidneys were functioning, they functioned 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And then when you go three days a week at center, that kind of really limits um, the amount of time that you are pulling fluid and toxins off your body. So much better for your heart, um, you know, but certainly, um, you know, it is it is responsibility. It is something, you know, you do need some space in your house. You do need to pay attention. You know, a lot of people say, oh, I just want to sleep through my treatment, you know, and, and certainly if you're doing your dialysis, home hemodialysis at home and you're a solo patient, you know, you want to be awake, but you, it's really only like a three and a half to four hour treatment. So, 
um, certainly, you know, if it's worth it for you to be able to have that quality of life and that um, it, that's availability for your schedule, um, you know, the, the staying awake for that three and a half to four hours doing your treatment is well worth it. Um, I don't know. Nancy, are there any questions? Yes, there are. Um, I do have one, and it's a perfect segue to what I was going to ask you about who's eligible and who is not eligible. And uh, we have a question. Uh, is a stroke patient on a feeding tube a good candidate for home hemodialysis if a trained person administers the treatment? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of times people are very weary. Um, so, um, I mean, we've had people saying with peritoneal dialysis, with the feeding tube people, some, some surgeons will say, no, you know, that because of the location. But absolutely, home hemodialysis, if you have somebody that is, is willing to do your treatment, um, you know, just think about the, the wear and tear of, of, of not having your loved one have to be transported back and forth to the clinic in, in, the, in the snow and the rain and, and just the whole process of that. Um, you know, so it saves on the wear and tear of, of just the, the transportation piece alone, but it, it definitely, it, it allows you to pull more frequent fluid off, right? So you're not having that cramping, you're, you're not having that low blood pressure. And another real key, and people have told me this in the past, is for people that are on hemodialysis, you know, sometimes you overdo it um, and you end up with fluid overload. And so a lot of times people will rush to the ER or they'll just be very, very uncomfortable until they can get in to, to, to get their treatment. But if, you have, if you're a home hemodialysis patient and you have your equipment at home, you basically just set your, set your machine up and you do a treatment. So you're, you're avoiding a hospitalization. You're avoiding, avoiding you know, stretching that heart muscle out from that fluid overload. But yeah, um, definitely definitely that would be a great candidate and i would suggest that you speak with the nephrologist or the nurse practitioner um, and get that rolling um you know it, it it does take a little bit of training but once you're trained i mean just like anything else you know you'll get comfortable and there's a lot of really great support from the nurses at the clinic and and for your loved ones i mean it's just um like i said just think about the transportation piece alone never mind you know them having to be uncomfortable trying to sit in a chair for the four hours that they're at the clinic um, you can dialyze them in the bed or whatever you know whatever, wherever they're more comfortable and at times that are more convenient for you as well so absolutely okay thank you joanne uh Providing that the patient is not a stroke patient or basically, I put in quotes, healthy, can both of these treatments be done alone? Absolutely. So, um, you know, so we, it took us a while to get brave enough for our nephrologists to agree to let patients do what we call solo hemodialysis. Um, just because, you know, there's some risk with peritoneal dialysis. That's a no brainer. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we've had, I have folks in their eighties and nineties that live alone, you know, um, it might take them a little longer, but you know, they can do peritoneal dialysis hands down. Um, we've taught people that are blind, people that, you know, have left sided or one sided weakness, because really with peritoneal dialysis, we teach a one handed technique. Right. So if you've had a stroke, you're weak on one side. We just teach you on the other side. Um, but for hemodialysis. Yep. I mean, so that's definitely a conversation to have with a nephrologist um, and they'll want to look at your records to make sure um, certainly. You know, if you have a lot of problems with your current in-center treatment, you know, in other words, you know, if you're if you're cramping and passing out and you're putting four or five kilos on between treatments and, you know, not showing up for treatments, you know, all of that is going to be looked at. Uh, but if you're pretty adherent with your treatment, um, you know, and, and you can, uh, you know, you know, do that training and, and get, you know, comfortable. Um, I would even suggest, so sometimes, you know, the nephrologist, or, you know, they're a little nervous, you know, maybe, you, you know, they don't have any hemo, solo hemo patients. So, I mean, a first step would be 
asking somebody at the clinic, meeting with your clinic manager to see if you could start what we call um, cannulation training in the clinic. So they may be able to get you started with training, you know, how to take care of your access, right? What to look for, how to clean it, how to put the needles in, how to do the taping. And, and so all of that would be, you know, showing your nephrologist, you're serious, you want to move forward with this. And that would be a good first step that I would recommend. Um, but, you know, we like we have a lot of people that do solo hemodialysis in our clinics. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you, Joanne. I don't see any more comments in the comments section. Um, I think you basically covered everything else. And we're coming to the one o'clock hour. In fact, it is one o'clock. But if you could just give I know if you could just give us some closing words and right. some encouragement for those that really want to t do this type of treatment. So, so you know, it, it's not for everyone, but absolutely everyone has the right to try, right? So, if you're interested in home hemo, um, you know, there's no reason why you can't, you know, speak with your. Uh, with your clinic manager or, or your nurse that, that helps you in center and let them know that you're interested and they can contact a home training nurse and she can come and sit with you um, because each area may have, you know, little nuances that they do a little bit differently. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, look things up online, um, talk to the home training nurse. And, and I'm, I've even, you know, we actually have in our area something we call experience the difference. And that's an opportunity for you to try the training. And, you know, but if you do that, I'm going to tell you, when you first go in, you'll be overwhelmed. You'll first, your first thought will be, I can't do this. But I say give it at least two or three weeks. A, after the first or even second week, you're going to start feeling better. Uh -huh. B, you know, you're going to kind of get used to it. I, I kind of compare it to, I, I, I will tell people, you know, before you could drive a car, you know, there's a lot involved with driving, right? It's not, you just don't turn the key and you go, right? So you're looking for this and the mirrors and the, and the, and the you know, the, the gauges and, you know, how to go forward, how to go backward, you know? So it's all a, a learning process. But once you get comfortable with it, it really, it really can make you feel a lot better. And, and, you know, and don't be discouraged, you know, kind of see it all the way through. And, and, and there's no reason why, you know, um, you can't switch up, right? So say, for example, you know, you say, well, I'm going to try peritoneal dialysis. You know, it is a surgery, you know, and, and once people start, a lot of times, I mean, I know people that have been on peritoneal dialysis for over 15 years, right? And um, sometimes the membrane kind of starts wearing out. And then we start talking about possibly switching to home hemodialysis. You know, they've already been a home patient. They're used to that independence. Um, and a lot of times, you know, people will convert over to home hemo or vice versa. If they're doing home hemodialysis, they may lose their care partner and not feel comfortable doing the, the treatment on their own. So we'll talk about peritoneal dialysis. Um, so, I mean, you absolutely have the right to, to make those changes and those choices. And, 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 and to not be discouraged. It's scary. I'm not going to say it's not scary that, you know, and a lot of times people will see things, you know, bad needles coming out in the clinic, people passing out things, coding, whatever in the clinic and say, oh my gosh, you know, there's no way I could do that at home. But you have to remember that when you do things at home, you're doing them slower and more frequent. So there's less symptoms of things that happen in the clinic. There's a different, tape, different taping procedure. I mean, we're gonna make sure that you're safe. So the nurse is gonna train you and not just for you to be confident, but for her to be confident that you're comfortable doing this. And like I said, there's a lot of really good support in the clinic. So you can kind of just reach out to your nurse with any of your concerns, so. Well, thank you so very much. Um, it's been very informative and I'm sure that we will be inviting you back <laughs> And for those of you that don't know, we have Kidney Chat every second Tuesday. And Joanne will be our guest uh, January 2024. So thank you, Joanne. And thank you to all of you who took the time out to join this live. Awesome. Take care and be safe. All right. Thanks. Take care. Bye-bye.